Section 24 of Diaries Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 5th July 1646. We took or rather purchased a boat, for it could not be brought back against the stream of the Rhone. We were two days going to Lyon, passing many admirable prospects of rocks and cliffs, and near the town, down a very steep declivity of water, for a full mile. From Lyon we proceeded the next morning, taking horse to Rouen, and lay that night at first. At Rouen we indulged ourselves with the best that all France affords, for here the provisions are choice and plentiful, so as the supper we had might have satisfied a prince. We lay in damask beds and were treated like emperors. The town is one of the neatest built in all France, on the brink of the Loire, and here we agreed with an old fisher to row us as far as Orléans. The first night we came as far as Nevers, early enough to see the town, the cathedral, Saint-Cyr, the Jesuits' college and the castle, a palace of the dukes, with the bridge to it nobly built. The next day we passed by La Charité, a pretty town, somewhat distant from the river. Here I lost my faithful spaniel Piccioli, who had followed me from Rome. It seems he had been taken up by some of the governor's pages or footmen without recovery, which was a great displeasure to me because the cur had many useful qualities. Orléans The next day we arrived at Orléans, taking our turns to row, of which I reckon my share came to little less than twenty leagues. Sometimes we footed it through pleasant fields and meadows, Sometimes we shot at fowls and other birds. Nothing came amiss. Sometimes we played at cards, while others sung or were composing verses, for we had the great poet Mr. Waller in our company, and some other ingenious persons. At Orléans we abode but one day. The next, leaving our mad captain behind us, I arrived at Paris, Rejoiced that after so many disasters and accidents in a tedious peregrination, I was gotten so near home, and here I resolved to rest myself before I went further. It was now October, and the only time that in my whole life that I spent most idly, tempted from my more profitable recesses, but I soon recovered my better resolutions and fell to my study learning the high Dutch and Spanish tongues, and now and then refreshing my dancing, and such exercises as I had long omitted, and which not in much reputation among the sober Italians. 28th January 1647 I changed my lodging in the Place de Monsieur de Metz, near the Abbey of Saint-Germain, and thence on the 12th of February to another in Rue Colombier, where I had a very fair apartment, which cost me four pistols per month. The 18th I frequented a course of chemistry, the famous Monsieur Le Febure operating upon most of the nobler processes. March 3rd, Monsieur Mercure began to teach me on the lute, though to small perfection. In May I fell sick and had very weak eyes, for which I was four times let bleed. 22nd May 1647 My valet, Herbert, robbed me of clothes and plate to the value of three score pounds, but through the diligence of Sir Richard Brown, His Majesty's resident at the Court of France, and with whose lady and family I had contracted a great friendship, and particularly set my affections on a daughter, I recovered most of them, obtaining of the judge, with no small difficulty, that the process against the thief should not concern his life, being his first offence. 10th June 1647 We concluded about my marriage, in order to which I went to Saint-Germain, where His Majesty, then Prince of Wales, had his court, to desire of Dr. Earl, then one of his chaplains, since Dean of Westminster, Clerk of the Closet and Bishop of Salisbury, that he would accompany me to Paris, which he did, 
and on Thursday 27th of June 1647 he married us in Sir Richard Brown's chapel between the hours of 11 and 12, some few select friends being present. And this being Corpus Christi feast was solemnly observed in this country. The streets were sumptuously hung with tapestry and strewed with flowers. 10th September 1647 being called into England to settle my affairs after an absence of four years, I took leave of the Prince and Queen, leaving my wife, yet very young, under the care of an excellent lady and prudent mother. 4th October 1647. I sealed and declared my will, and that morning went from Paris, taking my journey through Rouen, Dieppe, Villedieu and saint Valery where I stayed one day with Mr. Waller, with whom I had some affairs, and for which cause I took this circle to Calais, where I arrived on the 11th, and that night, embarking in a packet-boat, was by one o'clock got safe to Dover, for which I heartily put up my thanks to God, who had conducted me safe to my own country, and been merciful to me through so many aberrations. Hence taking post, I arrived at London the next day at evening, being the 2nd of October, New Style. Watton. 5th October 1647. I came to Watton, the place of my birth, to my brother, and on the 10th to Hampton Court, where I had the honour to kiss His Majesty's hand, and give him an account of several things I had in charge he being now in the power of those execrable villains who not long after murdered him. I lay at my cousin, Sergeant Hatton's at Thames Ditton, whence on the 13th I went to London. 14th October 1647 To Say's Court at Deptford in Kent, since my house, where I found Mr. Pretiman, my wife's uncle, who had charge of it, and the estate about it, during my father-in-law's residence in France. On the 15th I again occupied my own chambers in the Middle Temple. 9th November 1647 My sister opened to me her marriage with Mr Glanville. 14th January 1647-8 From London I went to Watton to see my young nephew, and thence to Baynard's in Ewhurst to visit my brother Richard. 5th February 1648, saw a tragic comedy acted in the cockpit after there had been none of these diversions for many years during the war. 28th February 1648, I went with my noble friend Sir William Ducey, afterward Lord Down, to Thistleworth, where we dined with the Clepsby crew, and afterward to see the rare miniatures of Peter Oliver and rounds of plaster, and then the curious flowers of Mr. Barrell's garden, who has some good medals and pictures. Sir Clepsby has fine Indian hangings, and a very good chimney-piece of watercolours by Bruegel, which I bought for him. 26th April 1648. There was a great uproar in London, that the rebel army quartering at Whitehall would plunder the city, on which there was published a proclamation for all to stand on their guard. 4th May 1648 Came up the Essex petitioners for an agreement between His Majesty and the rebels. The 16th, the Surrey men, addressed the Parliament for the same, of which some of them were slain and murdered by Cromwell's guards in the new palace yard. I now sold the impropriation of South Malling near Lewis in Sussex to Messrs Kemp and Alcock for three thousand pounds. Thirtieth of May sixteen forty eight. There was a rising now in Kent, my Lord of Norwich being at the head of them. Their first rendezvous was in Broomfield, next my house at Say's Court, whence they went to Maidstone, and so to Colchester, where was that memorable siege. 27th June 1648. I purchased the manor of Hercot in Worcestershire of my brother George for £3,300. 1st July 1648. 
I sate for my picture, in which there is a death's head, to Mr. Walker, that excellent painter. 10th July, 1648. News was brought to me of my Lord Francis Villiers being slain by the rebels near Kingston. 16th August, 1648. I went to Woodcott in Epsom to the wedding of my brother Richard, who married the daughter and co-heir of Esquire Min, lately deceased, by which he had a great estate both in land and money, on the death of a brother. The coach in which the bride and bridegroom were was overturned in coming home, but no harm was done. 28th August 1648 to London from Say's Court and saw the celebrated follies of Bartholomew Fair. 16th September 1648 came my lately married brother Richard and his wife to visit me when I showed them Greenwich and Her Majesty's Palace, now possessed by the rebels. 28th September 1648 I went to Albury to visit the Countess of Arundel and returned to Watton. 31st October 1648, I went to see my manor of Preston Beckhelvin and the Cliff House. 29th November 1648, myself with Mr Thomas Offley and Lady Gerard christened my niece Mary, eldest daughter of my brother George Evelyn, by my Lady Cotton, his second wife. I presented my niece a piece of plate which cost me eighteen pounds and caused this inscription to be set on it, In Memoriam Facti Anno CICIX XLIIX Caldecem 8 Virginum Castis Christianorum Innocentis Neptuavis Maria Johann Evelinus Avunculus et Susceptor Vasculum Hoccum Epigraph LMQD Ave Maria Gratia Cis Plena Dominus Tecum. 2nd December 1648. This day I sold my manor of Hercot for £3,400 to one Mr. Bridges. 13th December 1648. The Parliament now sat up the whole night and endeavoured to have concluded the Isle of Wight Treaty, but were surprised by the rebel army. The members dispersed, and great confusion everywhere, in expectation of what would be next. 17th December 1648. I heard an Italian sermon in Mercer's Chapel, one Dr Middleton, an acquaintance of mine, preaching. London. 18th December 1648. I got privately into the council of the rebel army at Whitehall where I heard horrid villainies. This was a most exceedingly wet year, neither frost nor snow all the winter for more than six days in all. Cattle died everywhere of a moraine. 1st January 1648-49 I had a lodging and some books at my father-in-law's house, Say's Court. 2nd January 1649 I went to see my old friend and fellow traveller, Mr Henshaw, who had two rare pieces of Stenwick's perspective. 17th January 1649. To London. I heard the rebel Peters incite the rebel powers met in the painted chamber to destroy his majesty, and saw that arch-traitor Bradshaw, who not long after condemned him. 19th January 1649. I returned home, passing an extraordinary danger of being drowned by our wherries falling foul in the night of another vessel then at anchor, shooting the bridge at three quarters ebb, for which his mercy God Almighty be praised. 21st January 1649. Was published my translation of Liberty and Servitude, for the preface of which I was severely threatened. 22nd January 1649 I went through a course of chemistry at Say's Court. Now was the Thames frozen over and horrid tempests of wind. 
the villainy of the rebels proceeding now so far as to try, condemn and murder our excellent king on the 30th of this month, struck me with such horror that I kept the day of his martyrdom of fast and would not be present at that execrable wickedness, receiving the sad account of it from my brother George and Mr Owen, who came to visit me this afternoon and recounted all the circumstances. 1st February 1649 Now were Duke Hamilton, the Earl of Norwich, Lord Capel, etc., at their trial before the rebels, new court of injustice. 15th February 1649 I went to see the collection of one Trine, a rich merchant who had some good pictures, especially a rare perspective of Stenwick, from thence to other virtuosos. The painter La Neve had an Andromeda, but I think it a copy after Van Dyck from Titian, for the original is in France. Where but the exchange has some rare things in miniature of Bruegel's, also putty, in twelve squares, that were plundered from Sir James Palmer. At Dubois we saw two tables of putty that were gotten, I know not how, out of the castle of St. Angelo by old Petit thought to be Titian's. He had some good heads of Palmer and one of Stenwick. Belcar showed us an excellent copy of His Majesty's Sleeping Venus and the Satire, with other figures, for now they have plundered, sold and dispersed a world of rare paintings of the kings and his loyal subjects. After all, Sir William Ducey showed me some excellent things in miniature, and in oil of Holbein's, Sir Thomas More's head, and a whole length figure of Edward the Sixth, which was certainly His Majesty's, also a picture of Queen Elizabeth, the Lady Isabella Thin, a rare painting of Rodenhammer, being a Susanna, and a Magdalen of Quintin the blacksmith, also a Henry the Eighth of Holbein, and Francis the First, rare indeed, but of whose hand I know not. Sixteenth February, sixteen forty nine. Paris being now strictly besieged by the Prince de Condé, my wife being shut up with her father and mother, I wrote a letter of consolation to her, and on the 22nd, having recommended Obadiah Walker, a learned and most ingenious person to be tutored to and travel with Mr. Hilliard's two sons, returned to Say's court. 25th February 1649 came to visit me Dr. Joyliffe, discoverer of the lymphatic vessels, and an excellent anatomist. 26 February 1649, came to see me Captain George Evelyn, my kinsman, the great traveller, and one who believed himself a better architect than really he was, witnessed the portico in the garden at Watton, yet the great room at Albury is somewhat better understood. He had a large mind, but overbuilt everything. 27th February 1649 Came out of France my wife's uncle, Paris still besieged, being robbed at sea by the Dunkirk pirates. I lost, among other goods, my wife's picture painted by Monsieur Bourgdon. 5th of March 1649 Now were the lords murdered in the palace yard. 18th March 1649 Mr. Owen, a sequestered and learned minister, preached in my parlour and gave us the Blessed Sacrament, now wholly out of use in, in the parish churches on which the Presbyterians and fanatics had usurped. 21st March 1649 I received letters from Paris from my wife, and from Sir Richard Brown, with whom I kept up a political correspondence, with no small danger of being discovered. 25th March 1649 I heard the common prayer, a rare thing in these days, in St Peter's at Poole's Wharf, London, and in the morning the Archbishop of Armagh, that pious person and learned man Usher, in Lincoln's Inn Chapel. London 2nd April 1649, 
to London and inventoried my movals that had hitherto been dispersed for fear of plundering, wrote into France, touching my sudden resolutions of coming over to them. On the 8th again heard an excellent discourse from Archbishop Usher on Ephesians 4, verse 26 to 27. My Italian collection being now arrived, came Moulin, the great chirurgian, to see and admire the tables of veins and arteries which I purchased and caused to be drawn out of several human bodies at Padua. 11th April 1649. Received news out of France that peace was concluded. Dined with Sir Joseph Evelyn at Westminster and on the 13th I saw a private dissection at Moulin's house. 17th April 1649 I fell dangerously ill of my head, was blistered and let bleed behind the ears and forehead. On the 23rd began to have ease by using the fumes of chamomile or embers applied to my ears, after all the physicians had done their best. 29th April 1649 I saw in London a huge ox bred in Kent, 17 feet in length, and much higher than I could reach. 12th May 1649 I purchased the manor of Worley Magna in Essex. In the afternoon went to see Gildren's collections of paintings, where I found Mr Endymion Porter of His Late Majesty's Bedchamber. 17th May 1649, went to Putney by water, in the barge with diverse ladies, to see the schools or colleges of the young gentlewomen. 19th May 1649, to see a rare cabinet of one Delabar who had some good paintings, especially a monk at his beads. 30th May 1649, unkingship was proclaimed and His Majesty's statues thrown down at St Paul's portico and the exchange. 7th June 1649 I visited Sir Arthur Hopton, brother to Sir Ralph Lord Hopton, that noble hero, who having been ambassador extraordinary of Spain, sojourned some time with my father-in-law at Paris, a most excellent person. Also Signora Lucrezia, a Greek lady whom I knew in Italy, now come over with her husband, an English gentleman. Also the Earl and Countess of Arundel, taking leave of them and other friends now ready to depart for France. This night was a scuffle between some rebel soldiers and gentlemen about the temple. June 10th, 1649 preached to the Archbishop of Armagh in Lincoln's Inn from Romans 5, verse 13. I received the Blessed Sacrament preparatory to my journey. 13th June 1649. I dined with my worthy friend Sir John Owen, newly freed from sentence of death among the lords that suffered. With him was one Carew, who played incomparably on the Welsh harp. Afterward I treated diverse ladies of my relations in Spring Garden. This night was buried with great pomp Dorislaus, slain at The Hague, the villain who managed the trial against his sacred majesty. 17th June 1649 I got a pass from the rebel Bradshaw, then in great power. 20th June 1649 I went to Putney and other places on the Thames to take prospects in crayon to carry into France where I thought to have them engraved. 2nd July 1649 I went from Watton to Godstone, the residence of Sir John Evelyn, where was also Sir John Evelyn of Wilts, when I took leave of both Sir John's and their ladies. Mem, the prodigious memory of Sir John of Wilt's daughter, since married to Mr W. Pierpont, and mother of the present Earl of Kingston. I return to Say's court this night. 4th July 1649. Visited Lady Hatton, her lord sojourning at Paris with my father-in-law. 
9th July 1649, dined with Sir Walter Pye and my good friend Mr. Eaton, afterward a judge, who corresponded with me in France. 11th July 1649, came to see me old Alexander Ross, the divine historian and poet, Mr. Henshaw, Mr. Scudamore and other friends to take leave of me. Gravesend, 12th July 1649. It was about three in the afternoon I took oars for Gravesend, accompanied by my cousin Stevens and sister Glanville, who there supped with me and returned. Whence I took post immediately to Dover, where I arrived by nine in the morning, and at about eleven that night went on board a bark guarded by a pinnace of eight guns. This being the first time the packet boat had obtained a convoy, having several times before been pillaged. We had a good passage, though chased for some hours by a pirate, but he dared not attack our frigate, and we then chased him till he got under the protection of the castle at Calais. There was a small privateer belonging to the Prince of Wales. I carried over with me my servant Richard Hoare, an incomparable writer of several hands, whom I afterward preferred in the prerogative office at the return of His Majesty. Lady Catherine Scott, daughter of the Earl of Norwich, followed us in a shallop with Mr. Arthur Slingsby, who left England incognito. At the entrance of the town, the Lieutenant Governor, being on his horse with the guards, let us pass courteously. I visited Sir Richard Lloyd, an English gentleman, and walked in the church, where the ornament above the high altar of black marble is very fine, and there is a good picture of the Assumption. The citadel seems to be impregnable, and the whole country about it to be laid under water by sluices for many miles. 16th July 1649 we departed from Paris in company with that very pleasant lady, Lady Catherine Scott, and others. In all this journey we were greatly apprehensive of parties which caused us to alight often out of our coach and walk separately on foot with our guns on our shoulders in all suspected places. Paris, 1st August 1649. At three in the afternoon we came to Saint-Denis, saw the rarities of the church and treasury, and so to Paris that evening. The next day came to welcome me at dinner the Lord High Treasurer Cottingdon, Sir Edward Hyde, Chancellor, Sir Edward Nicholas, Secretary of State, Sir George Carteret, Governor of Jersey, and Dr Earl, having now been absent from my wife above a year and a half. 18th August 1649 I went to Saint-Germain to kiss His Majesty's hand. In the coach, which was my Lord Wilmot's, went Mrs. Barlow, the King's mistress, and mother to the Duke of Monmouth, a brown, beautiful, bold, but insipid creature. 19th August 1649. I went to salute the French King and the Queen Dowager, and on the 21st, returned in one of the Queen's coaches with my Lord Germain, Duke of Buckingham, Lord Wentworth and Mr Crofts, since Lord Crofts. 7th September 1649. Went with my wife and dear cousin to Saint-Germain and kissed the Queen Mother's hand. Dined with my Lord Keeper and Lord Hatton. Diverse of the great men of France came to see the King. The next day came the Prince of Condé, Returning to Paris, we went to see the President Mason's palace, built castle-wise, of a milk-white fine free stone. The house not vast, but well contrived, especially the staircase and the ornaments of putty about it. It is environed in a dry moat, the offices underground, the gardens very excellent, with extraordinary long walks, set with elms, and a noble prospect toward the forest and on the Seine towards Paris. Take it altogether, the meadows, walks, river, forest, corn ground and vineyards, I hardly saw anything in Italy to exceed it. The iron gates are very magnificent. He has pulled down a whole village to make room for his pleasure about it. 
12th September 1649. Dr. Crichton, a Scotchman and one of His Majesty's chaplains, a learned Grecian who set out the Council of Florence, preached. 13th September 1649. The King invited the Prince of Condé to supper at Saint Cloud. There I kissed the Duke of York's hand in the tennis court, where I saw a famous match between Monsieur Saumur and Colonel Cook, and so returned to Paris. It was noised about that I was knighted, a dignity I often declined. 1st October 1649. Went with my cousin Tuke, afterwards to Samuel, to see the fountains of saint Cloud and Ruel, and after dinner to talk with a poor, ignorant and superstitious anchorite at Mount Calvary, and so to Paris. 2nd October 1649. Came Mr. William Coventry, afterwards Sir William, and the Duke's secretary, etc., to visit me. 5th October 1649. Dined with Sir George Ratcliffe, the great favourite of the late Earl of Stratford, formerly Lord Deputy of Ireland, decapitated. 7th October 1649. To the Louvre, to visit the Countess of Moreton, governess to Madame. 15th October 1649. Came news of Drogheda being taken by the rebels and all put to the sword, which made us very sad, forerunning the loss of all Ireland. 21st October 1649. I went to hear Dr. Davinson's lecture in the physical garden and see his laboratory, he being prefect of that excellent garden and Professor Botanicus. 30th of October 1649. I was at the funeral of one Mr. Downs, a sober English gentleman. We accompanied his corpse to Charenton, where he was interred in a cabbage garden, yet with the office of our church, which was said before in our chapel at Paris. Here I saw also where they buried the great soldier Gassion, who had a tomb built over him like a fountain, the design and materials mean enough. I returned to Paris with Philip Musgrave and Sir Marmaduke Langdale, since Lord Langdale. Memorandum. This was a very sickly and mortal autumn. 5th November 1649. I received diverse letters out of England requiring me to come over about settling some of my concerns. 7th November 1649. Dr George Morley, since Bishop of Winchester, preached in our chapel on Matthew 4 verse 3. 18th November 1649. I went with my father-in-law to see his audience at the French court, where, next to the Pope's nuncio, he was introduced by the Master of Ceremonies, and after delivery of his credentials, as from our King, since his father's murder, he was most graciously received by the King of France and his mother, with whom he had a long audience. This was in the Palais Cardinal. After this, being presented to His Majesty and the Queen Regent, I went to see the house built by the late great Cardinal de Richelieu. The most observable thing is the gallery, painted with the portraits of the most illustrious persons and single actions in France, with innumerable emblems between every table. In the middle of the gallery is a neat chapel, rarely paved in work and devices of several sorts of marble. Besides the altarpiece and two statues of white marble, one of St. John, the other of the Virgin Mary by Bernini. The rest of the apartments are rarely gilded and carved, with some good modern paintings. In the presence hang three huge branches of crystal. In the French king's bedchamber is an alcove like another chamber, set as it were in a chamber like a movable box, with a rich embroidered bed. The fabric of the palace is not magnificent, being but of two storeys, but the garden is so spacious as to contain a noble basin and fountain continually playing, and there is a mall with an elbow or turning to protect it. So I left His Majesty on the terrace, busy in seeing a bull-baiting, and returned home in Prince Edward's coach with Mr. Paul, the Prince-Elector's agent. 19th November 1649 
visited Mr. Waller, where meeting Dr. Holden, an English Sorbon divine, we fell into some discourse about religion. 28th December 1649. Going to wait on Mr. Waller, I viewed St. Stephen's Church. The building, though Gothic, is full of carving. Within it is beautiful, especially the choir and winding stairs. The glass is well painted, and the tapestry hung up this day about the choir, representing the conversion of Constantine, was exceedingly rich. I went to that excellent engraver Dubos for his instruction about some difficulties in perspective which were delivered in his book. I concluded this year in health, for which I give solemn thanks to Almighty God. End of section 24